You really do have to face it and give yourself the space to feel the grief. Num numbing it with Netflix, um, oversleeping, excessive time wasting is really just suppressing that feeling. And the worst thing we can do is just suppress whatever it is that we're feeling. I really liken it to like when you have a bottle of soda, a can of soda. What would happen if you took that soda and you started shaking it and shaking it over and over again. What we know is that at some point when you open it up, it's going to explode all over the place. And that's very similar to our own emotional state. When we don't regulate it, when we just suppress what it is that we're feeling, it just comes back twice as strong. And it just, we end up exploding. We end up overreacting to situations. We end up projecting our, our issues, our emotional state onto other people around us. And we even begin to internalize stress in a way that is really unhealthy, that we end up actually somaticizing and having certain areas of tension in our bodies that can even contribute, um, research says, to chronic illnesses. So it's so important for you to just grieve if you need to grieve. I think the best way to do it is, you know, after Aisha prayer, you know, sit on your prayer mat and talk to Allah out loud, just from your heart, what you're dealing with, cry to him, um, release your difficulties because he's hearing us. And in a time like this, he is our best friend. He knows what you're going through. And so acknowledge how you're feeling. At the same time, we want to talk about specific ways to regulate these emotions. Just because we have these emotions and they're normal doesn't mean that we should over-identify with our emotions. Because what happens is when we start to take our emotions as fact and we over-identify with how we're feeling, we start to become very reactionary and we make very poor decisions in those moments. So I'm going to talk to you about not how to suppress those emotions, but how to regulate it, especially in a time like this. Before I do that, I want to talk about how the brain works. So, you know, we have to, before we get to the tools of how to cope with the panic, the fear of the unknown, I find it very empowering with my clients that, that they know how their brains function so that they can really be in control. So we know the brain has about 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day. That is a lot, a lot of thoughts. Some of those thoughts are going to be normal, everyday thoughts. Some of them are going to be very weird, random, strange thoughts that you're like, why am I even thinking that? Um, you know, you might be a very, very good person, but sometimes you have a terrible, awful thought and you're like, oh my God, where did that come from? And some thoughts are going to be rational thoughts, okay? What we need to re realize about our thoughts is we need to see them outside of ourselves, that um, we all have these kinds of thoughts and either you can, you, it, it's really just all about how you react to it. So not all of our thoughts are factual um, and we just have to recognize that once that thought is paired with an emotion, it begins to affect our reality and it begins to translate into behavior. And that's when the thought may become a problem. The other thing I want you to understand about your brain is most of our thoughts are actually negative. About 80% of our thoughts, just if we let them come out the way um, they are, they, they will be negative thoughts. We, there's something in the field of psychology called negativity bias, okay? And so, again, one, one thing is not to feel bad about these thoughts. Sometimes we feel very bad, but recognize that most of our thoughts are negative, and so that's why we really have to work hard and make an intentional effort to rewire our minds. So even prior to this pandemic, I'm sure many of you from time to time have struggled with automatic negative thoughts. 
um, thoughts like, you know, I'm not good enough, um, I'm so stupid, I'm never going to succeed. And, you know, you might have your own automatic negative thoughts that you go to in difficult times. So if we aren't careful, these automatic negative thoughts become our self-talk. They become our conversation with ourselves. So now, in, in light of this pandemic, what might be an automatic negative thought that somebody would experience? An example is, I'm never going to survive this. Um, I'm going to die. I'm going to lose my job. This is too much for me to deal with. And you know what? This is so dangerous because as these automatic ne negative thoughts build one after the other, the stress accumulates more and more and more. So you really have to intercept these thoughts. You can't let them keep going because if you do, this pro thought process will create fear and it'll allow anxiety to hijack your entire system. So when you experience anxiety, where that's coming from is the amygdala in our brain. It's this little almond um, portion of our brain. It's very small. But the way that it gets triggered is actually through our breathing. So when, if you notice when you're stressed or even when you're angry, you know, you might be breathing in such a way that is very quick. Um, maybe you'll even stop breathing. It's definitely not a normal flow of breathing. So your breathing actually sends a message to the amygdala that, hey, um, I'm in danger right now. Something is wrong. So what happens is the body begins to go into a fight or flight mode. The entire central nervous system gets affected in your body. Um, several different, it's not just our brain. It's a lot of different organisms, your pupils, your bladder. I mean, so many different organs get affected. Of course, we know your heart and your body begins to release chemicals, chemicals like cortisol. When cortisol is released, it's really preparing the body to protect itself in the form of some kind of intense physical activity to protect itself from danger. So you can imagine how draining it is on the body to experience stress, okay? So the thing is, unless there's a lion that you're running away from, or you're driving in your car and somebody swerves out in front of you, you know, this intense physical reaction is not going to be helping you, especially in a pandemic. It's going to be hurting you because what's happening is the stress that you're experiencing is draining your body. It's weakening your immune system. So not only is the stress of the unknown, it's not going to help. It's going to actually make you more likely to contract this virus if you are in a state of, of stress because your immune system is being compromised. So what's going to help you right now? It's going to be building your psychological resilience and your spiritual resilience. And we shouldn't underestimate um, these aspects of ourselves. And I'll tell you, this is a great opportunity. This pandemic is a great opportunity to build your mental muscle. And if you can get through this pandemic, inshallah, looking back, You'll be like, man, I got through a, a pandemic. I can get through anything in life, inshallah. So just have a positive attitude about this. So research shows that in order to get through any kind of adversity with strength and with resilience, a person must think like an optimist. And there's two things that optimists focus on when it comes to dealing with adversity. The first thing is non-permanence, non-permanence. The understanding that whatever it is we're going through, it's not gonna last forever. We know there have been pandemics in the past, and yes, they are devastating in many ways, but we, we can, if we take precautions, if we're smart about this, inshallah, we're gonna get through it. Actually, if we think about it, nothing in this world is permanent. Everything is going to fade away. The only thing that is permanent is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, that needs to be our source as we're going through this difficulty, focusing on our permanent, 
Lord who, who has control over all things. That's where we, we, we put our submission in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing he is in control of all of this. And the second thing that people who are optimistic do in adversity is they focus on gratitude. They focus on what can I be grateful for right now? You know, might say something, some positive affirmation like Alhamdulillah, that I know it's hard to stay home and practice social distancing, but at least I can stay home right now. And you know what? This has given me a great opportunity to spend more time with my family, to slow down, to connect, to, to spend more time in worship, looking at the bright side of the picture. Even from an environmental, uh, environmental perspective, recognizing that, you know, by, by practicing social distancing and having a lot of these big corporations, um, you know, close down, we're actually de helping to detox the world, right, from the pollutants, from all the emissions from the cars. We know if we continue at the rate that we're continuing polluting this planet, that we're not going to have a planet at some point. So perhaps this is a way to detox the world and to make it a better place. And inshallah, hopefully we walk away from this experience thinking about this and not forgetting that how much we need to take care of our planet and the world and those around us. So some people say to me, I know Sister Anissa, but I'm just a pessimist. I'm a negative person and it's not gonna change. That's just the way that I am. And to this I say that you really have no other choice in this situation. You have to rewire your mind. You are not gonna become a resilient person in life if you simply choose to accept any negative thought that comes to your mind. Not to mention, you know, being a pessimist is really not part of Islam. You know, Islam is a religion of looking at the glass half full, thinking positively about the future. You know, maybe you were raised by people that were very pessimistic, or you had a lot of disappointing experiences in your life. And so you chose to have this pessimistic attitude as a form of protection. But this is a maladaptive coping mechanism, this pessimism, and it must be worked on. So let's talk about how to rewire your mind to become more balanced. The first thing is we got to think about how do we how do we address the negative self-talk? How do we address an automatic negative thoughts and pessimism? So again, we want to intercept those thoughts. We're going to interrupt the process. Think about this. If you're on Netflix, you know, you have a plethora of different things to choose from, right? If you picked a sitcom or a channel that you had no interest in, you didn't like, was making you feel uncomfortable, you would change it, right? So it's the same with our own thoughts. We don't have to stay on a thought that is making us uncomfortable. In fact, we need to pick up the remote and we need to change the channel within our minds. So let's talk about an example of how to break the thought feeling behavior cycle because our thoughts affect how we feel our feeling affects our behavior. Our behavior re uh, reinforces our thinking. So it's an endless cycle. So let's say I have a thought of, you know, oh my God, you know, I'm going to die. Who's going to look after my children? Um, the feeling of having this thought is I'm overwhelmed. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling anxious. The response to that may be that I go into a kind of depressive state. I begin to oversleep. I begin to become very negative in my communication towards family members. I begin to numb myself with overeating or, you know, excessive time wasters like video games. All of this is counterproductive to our growth. It's not conducive whatsoever. Or you can have the same thought and say, you know what? I'm not even there yet. I'm not dying. Alhamdulillah, I, my husband's not dying. I can't predict the future. We've got to keep in mind, none of us has a magic ball. We can't predict the future. Alhamdulillah, I'm healthy. I'm strong. You know, stay present focused with the reality that is now, okay? Because you're going to be able to navigate that concern, inshallah, if it does become a reality. The problem is when we create unknown 
realities and dramas in our minds that haven't even occurred yet. So just remind yourself to stay present, take it one day at a time. I can't predict the future. Many of us recognize that thousands of thousands of people die every year just by getting in their cars from accidents, right? But if we were to, every time we left our house, put our key in the ignition and say, oh my God, what if I die? You know, what if I get in an accident? None of us would get on the road and start driving. But what you do is you have to unpack that thought and say, okay, I mean, I have the skills. I know where the brake is. If somebody were to swerve out in front of me, um, I have all the paperwork that I need. If I were to get into an accident, I know I have to be vigilant on the road. So you have to trust that, you know, you might be driving on the road and some, you know, you don't know what's going to happen a mile down the road. Maybe a deer is going to come out in front of your car. You don't know. Maybe a little kid is going to be on the, on the bike and you almost hit them. Like anything can happen, but you trust yourself as a driver to know that you have the skill set, alhamdulillah, that at some point, if something like that were to happen, you're going to be vigilant and you're going to know what to do. And it's very similar in this situation. We have got to take this one step at a time and, you know, recognize that when we get to those points, then we'll get into the problem solving mode. Then we'll, we'll think from the prefrontal cortex, not the amygdala, about how to deal with this appropriately. So when I work with clients who struggle with anxiety, I notice a couple things about their language. It's hardly ever rooted in the present moment. The language is always talking about what's gonna happen in the future. Um, I work with people, for example, who have commitment issues, who are scared of getting married. You know, what if I get married and end up divorced? What if um, even friendships, you know, why bother making friends? What if this friend just ends up leaving me in the end? Why is it even worth trying? So you see that some people, they run away from potentially great opportunities and relationships because what they do is they start catastrophizing. They start thinking, what is the worst possible thing that is going to happen? And this is a maladaptive coping strategy. You don't want to think all the time, what's the worst possible thing that's going to happen? And when you get to the root of why people catastrophize, it's often because they're trying to do two things. One, protect themselves from disappointment. They think if they you know, set themselves up for believing the worst, with, if the worst happens, they'll be prepared for it, which no one can really be prepared for the worst. Right? And then managing the fear around the unknown. It's a, it's a control thing. They think that if they you know, catastrophize, they're going to somehow be able to manage their um, uncertainty around situations. So the problem with this is they're, they're not setting themselves up for disappointment, but rather they're robbing themselves of their present peace of mind. And that's what happens when we live in the, in the future, constantly worrying about what's going to happen next. We don't have quality of life anymore. We don't have contentment. We don't have gratitude because we're constantly worried about what's going to happen next. We're constantly thinking the worst about the future. So what are people doing right now when it comes to catastrophizing? They're saying things like, what if we run out of food? What if we run out of toilet paper? They're, they're panic buying, they're hoarding. Even though we're not experiencing a supply shortage whatsoever, they're trying to manage this fear of the unknown by saying, let me just do something. Let me do anything, even if it's buying something, because I can't get a, buy a vaccine for this. You know, I can't buy a pill to stop this. So I'm gonna do anything, even if it doesn't make sense, to help me feel more prepared for this situation, even though toilet paper isn't gonna change anything. And then people get into this herd mentality where it's like, okay, if everybody needs that toilet paper, I guess I need it too. Um, and then everybody's wanting the same thing. So when people are operating at that level, they're in fight or flight mode. They're operating at the point of the amygdala right? So I want to teach you a quick way, very easy way, 
to get out of the fight or flight response and start going into rest and digest mode. Again, when you're operating from the prefrontal cortex, you're, you're not, again, going to that primal amygdala anymore. You're, you're focused on positive decision making, planning, and executive functioning in a way that's healthy, in a way that's balanced and rational. So the main way to do this is just simply with your own breathing, okay? So for example, you can, you can do this at any time, you know, just check in with yourself throughout the day. How's my breathing doing? If you notice you're breathing very quickly, or maybe you're stressed and you've kind of it's become irregular, just put your hand on your heart. You inhale through your nose to the count of five. Okay, so just two, three, four, five, and then you exhale from your mouth to the count of five. And you do this a couple of times. And as you're inhaling, just visualize yourself inhaling positivity, um, hope in Allah, hope in a better future, knowing that this is going to pass and exhale all the negativity that you're hearing and really visualize that. So this at the simplest level will send a message to the amygdala that everything's okay. You don't need to fight anything right now. And that's the quickest way to intercept it. So I'm going to do a quick, um, guided imagery activity with you as well. Some of you may be familiar with guided imagery, but if you are driving right now, please do not do this. Take a pause from this and come back and listen to it later um, because it can make you very, very um, kind of relaxed to the point that you can't focus on the driving. So just make sure you're at home, you're, you're somewhere um, where you can be in a relaxed state. So many of you are stuck at home I thought it would be a good idea to take us on a little vacation, inshallah. So all you're going to do is you're going to sit back in a supportive chair, lie on, or you can lie on your back. And I just want you to listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to be taking you on a mini vacation. So relax your body, release any areas of tension, allow your arms to go limp, bend your legs, Feel your arms and legs becoming loose and relaxed. Now relax your neck and back by releasing your spine. Release the hold of your muscles all the way from your head, down your back, along each vertebra to the tip of your spine. Breathe deeply into your diaphragm, drawing air fully into your lungs and release the air with a whooshing sound. Breathe in again slowly. Pause for a moment and breathe out. Draw a deep breath in and out. In, out become more and more relaxed with each breath. Feel your body giving up all the tension, becoming relaxed and calm, peaceful. Feel a wave of relaxation flow from the soles of your feet to your ankles, lower legs, hip, pelvic area, abdomen, chest, back, hands, lower arms, elbows, upper arms, shoulders, neck, back of your head, face, and the top of your head. Allow your entire body to rest heavily on the surface where you sit or lie. Now that your body is fully relaxed, allow the, the relaxation to begin. Imagine you are walking towards the ocean, walking through a beautiful tropical forest. You can hear the waves up ahead. You can smell the ocean spray. The air is moist and warm. Feel a pleasant, cool breeze blowing through the trees. You walk along a path, 
coming closer to the sea. As you come to the edge of the trees, you see the brilliant aqua color of the ocean ahead. You walk out of the forest and onto a long stretch of white sand. The sand is very soft powder. Imagine taking off your shoes and walking through the hot white sand towards the water. The beach is wide and long. Hear the waves crashing to the shore. Smell the clean salt water and beach. You gaze again towards the water. It's a bright blue green. See the waves washing up onto the sand and receding back towards the ocean, washing up and flowing back down. Enjoy the ever repeating rhythm of the waves. As you approach the water, you can feel the mist from the ocean on your skin. You walk closer to the waves and feel the sand becoming wet and firm. A wave washes over the sand towards you. And as you step forward, more waves wash over your feet. Feel the water provide relief from the heat. Walk further and further into the clear, clean water. The water is pleasant, relaxing, providing relief from the hot sun, cool but not cold. You walk further into the water if you wish, swim if you want to, enjoy the ocean for a few minutes, allow the relaxation to deepen, more and more relaxed, enjoy the ocean. Up ahead is a comfortable lounge chair and towel just for you. Sit or lie down in the chair or spread a towel on the sand. Relax on the chair towel, enjoying the sun, the breeze and the waves. You feel peaceful and relaxed. Allow all your stress to melt away. When you are ready to return from your vacation, do so slowly, bringing yourself back to your usual level of alertness and awareness, keeping with you the feeling of calm and relaxation, feeling ready to return to your day. Open up your eyes, stretch your muscles, and become fully alert. So you can type in the chat box how that experience was for you. Inshallah, you found it to be relaxing, you found it to be helpful, like a little mini vacation to get yourself out of the house. And a lot of people report that they sleep better when they do guided meditations. And this is something that you can practice at any time. Your body actually didn't know the difference at this moment. A lot of people were saying this is very relaxing. You can choose where you want to take your mind to. That's the thing. And that's the key with this. When, when you're feeling uh, in a negative emotion, it really does have a direct effect on your body. If you think about a time where you felt very embarrassed, what happened to your body? Your face probably got red, your ears probably, you know, start feeling hot. So you can, if you trick your mind, you can take it anywhere that you want to go and you can feel as if you're actually there, even though we're stuck at home. You know, try, try Insight Timer app. It has a lot of these guided meditations that you can do to help get you through this time to make you feel a little more relaxed. So, you know, there's a lot that's not in our power right now with this situation. Your peace and your calm, however, that is in your power. Nothing can disturb that power, okay? Nothing. No matter what's happening on the outside, you can always visualize yourself getting through anything. And by doing this, you're strengthening your resiliency. So I just want to conclude by talking about some other practical tips real quick to get us through this time. First thing, be very careful about your media um, intake. I, I know some people are just glued to their television and to their phones right now. And that can, even for myself the other day, I was wondering, you know, why was I feeling so stressed out? Because I'm, I'm pretty good at managing this. And I realized so many family members and friends 
were sending me videos on this and I was looking at the news and everything on my social media feed was just coronavirus, coronavirus. And I, and I had to just say, I'm not looking at the phone for the rest of the, the next couple of days. Um, it's okay to check in with the news maybe once, maximum twice a day in the morning and the night, just to see if there's anything new that we can do to help prevent um, the, the spread of this or how to contract it or just to know what's going on in the world. But if you're constantly glued to your phone, you, you really, you know, you're going to wish that you just didn't do that. At the end of the day, when we're all through this and we've gotten past this, we're going to wish that we were just more present with our family and took advantage of this time and we're more present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing is just because you, you have to practice um, social distancing doesn't mean you can't go out to a park or to a wooded area where, of course, it's not crowded. You don't want to go to a crowded park or area, but it's very good to go for nature walks. Actually, they've done research to find that trees release something called phytonicides, and, and these things help boost immunity. So um, going out in nature, taking a walk, being smart about it, of course, you know, that, that can really help get you through this time. Get plenty of rest during this time. Maybe you have been working really, really hard and you found that you just, you're getting only four hours of sleep a night or something like that. Make sure, you know, you're getting at least six. To, in order to function on, on a, a positive level, you need at least six hours of sleep, but, you know, eight or more is even better. So take care of yourself, get rest during this time. Um, in moderation, of course, and try to communicate with family if you need to about space issues, because I know some people um, find it hard to constantly be around a lot of noise or a lot of, um, you know, just constantly not having their own space to be able to retreat to and to find some inner peace. So it's okay to communicate with family that you just need a break. You, you, you want to, you need some time to yourself and to close the door of your bedroom. And I think that, you know, we, we have to give all, everyone their, their own space right now in order to cope and deal with this. Have a routine. That's very important. So I recommend before you go to bed at night, identify three things you want to do the next day. You can just send yourself a quick email that, you know, tomorrow, these are three things that I, I would help me feel productive that I want to take advantage of. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of books that you haven't gotten around to, a course that you've wanted to take. Try to make the best of this time. And, you know, being productive, it can be a good d distraction just for everything that's going on right now. Um, the other thing is if when you're feeling a sense of fear, okay, I want you to recognize that as normal, but at the same time, visualize yourself transforming that energy into something else and transform that energy into prayer. Okay. So just take that, get on the prayer mat if you need to, and, and talk to Allah about what's going on. Or get, the other thing you can do is put some sadaqa out for yourself, for your family members and friends. Um, put a, even just a few cents, a jar, a few cents a day in the name of people that you care about for their protection. So these are just some spiritual things that we can do because we do want to think um, how to get through this with spiritual resilience, inshallah. And also keep in mind that by staying home, by practicing social distancing, you're a hero when you do that. You are saving lives. That's a form of worship. And it might feel like by doing that, we're not doing much and we'll feel powerless, but you're doing quite a bit by doing this. You're flattening the curve. You're preventing our hospitals from becoming inundated with too many patients they can't take care of. So this is a form of worship Allah's going to reward you for. So take it seriously. The last thing is take care of your mental health. Okay, this is incredibly important during this time. Some people I know they might be looking at this time saying, you know, maybe this is a good time to get off my medication or, you know, because I, I can't have, um, you know, face-to-face -face appointments with my counselor. Um, you know, I should just try to deal with this on my own. But if for people who are already struggling with pre-existing mental health related concerns, panic attacks, clinical anxiety, depression, and other mood disorders and issues, um, this can be really triggering this situation. So this is not a time 
to just take a break and say, I'm not going to um, talk to a professional anymore. See if a counselor you're already working with is willing to do distance-based sessions with you. Um, and also, if you don't have anybody that you're already working with and you're interested in getting support, you can reach out to me um, through my website, anisadiab.com, and I do provide distance-based support um, for anxiety and depression and relationship issues. And I know I've been talking to a lot of clients in the past weeks who have been struggling with this pandemic and we talk about ways to cope through it. So please reach out, please take care of your mental health. And the other thing to remember is we need to take care of others around us. Ramadan is coming up. I think it's actually beautiful. I think there's a hikmah and wisdom for why this is all happening right before Ramadan. And you know, when Ramadan comes, inshallah, especially that's a time where we usually think about how we can help other people out. But even with this pandemic, it's especially important to check in with our elderly community, people that are living on their own, who are maybe very fearful of going to the grocery store, calling them up, um, saying, how can I help you through this time? Because all of us need different things to get through this, right? All of us are struggling with this in a different way from other people. So checking in with them, what can I do for you? Can I pick up some extra groceries for you and leave it at your doorstep? Because that's how we're gonna keep planting the tree that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him talked about by thinking, how can we make a difference during this time? How can we support each other? And if there's anything I want you to take away from today's webinar, it's hope. I want you to have hope in Allah, hope in a better future, hope that we're gonna get through this together. And we are as human beings more resilient than we know. And this, is, this should be an ex, a spiritual awakening for all of us. We should be asking ourselves if, you know, if we had a year left to live, you know, what would we be doing differently to enhance our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, we, we've got to have hope, you know, for every sickness that Allah has sent down, our prophets and, you know, imams have talked about there being a cure for that sickness. So we're going to see a remedy to this, inshallah. We just need to put our hope in him. This is not a punishment. This is not the end of the world. This is a test, a really big test. But you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared us for this moment. He has prepared us and he says specifically in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُورِ وَنَقْسٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We're going to test you with something of fear, with something of hunger, with loss of wealth. And we're going to test you with lives and fruits. But give good tidings to those who are patient, that when a disaster strikes them, they say, Indeed, we belong to Allah, and indeed to him, we're going to return. So Allah's prepared us for this moment. He said, I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you hard. And you know what? We have been preparing for this through our own worship of Allah, through practicing sabr in various different forms throughout our life. Now Allah is turning to us, and he's saying, okay, what are you going to do? This is the real test. Are you, how are you going to respond in this situation? Allah has prepared you for this moment. And if you don't feel prepared, take this time now to, to strengthen your spiritual and psychological resiliency because you absolutely can get through this. Allah doesn't give us more of a burden than we can handle or bear. So having said that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the Q&A. And I thank you so much for joining today. Um, what questions do you have? If you can just type it into the chat box, by the way, that's the best way we can ask the questions. Also, Anissa, that uh, you can ask a question. If you go to the reactions on the bottom right and you hit the hand, it's for clapping. But uh, <laughs> there's if you some that, hand, that people ask. Um, yes, uh, so somebody asked about sharing the guided meditation script. I can share that with you. Inshallah, if you, if you, um, yeah, I can send it to that number, inshallah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? 
Thank you so much for all your wonderful comments. I see so many positive kind remarks here. I'm glad that people have benefited from this discussion. Alhamdulillah, thank you. Okay, I'm currently um, in online school and I'm finding it really hard to stay motivated. Um, how do you recommend to do so? So I think the first thing is to, to do some digging within yourself and figure out, remember we talked about our thoughts and how that can impact our feeling and behavior. What thoughts might you be having to, that are preventing you from getting started? Um, I remember, you know, I've talked to several clients who struggle academically with getting started on their projects. And sometimes they have this block where it's like they, they believe they're not gonna understand the material that they're reading because they failed that class before, or um, maybe they had to switch ma majors and they feel like such a failure for not being able to finish their previous degree. And they just, they start having thoughts of, you know, I don't even know why I'm trying to start studying. So you, everybody's different. You, you have to dig deep within you and, and see what are those thoughts coming to mind that are making it difficult for you to feel motivated and then use the technique that we talked about earlier to, to balance your mind, to have a more positive mindset and approach to the studying process. So try to, to develop some insight with that, inshallah, and you might be able to break through with that block. Okay, so um, another person is asking how to not feel fearful if we're going out for a walk or getting groceries. I feel like I'm doing something wrong if I go outside. So the main thing is we shouldn't, you know, make ourselves feel guilty at all for any emotion that we feel. So if you're feeling fearful, that is normal. That is okay. I remember the other day I took my daughter out for the first time in two weeks. We went to a, a park that was very open and there wasn't that many people. It was easy to keep a distance from people, but there were things I, I hadn't about like what do you do when you come in the house because do you have corona on the the soles of your shoes and okay I guess I should take my shoes off before I even come in the house and clean them so I think that it's normal it is a normal emotion to for you to feel fearful during that experience but just again go into that deep breathing mode and remind yourself that it's okay to feel nervous about this but you know, you're doing everything you can when you're going out to, to keep your distance from other people. You're bringing hand sanitizer with you. Um, you're, you're doing your best to get in and out of the grocery store as quick as possible. Maybe see if you can look into a delivery service or something like that so that it's, you have to go out less frequently. But everyone is, is feeling this way right now and it's valid. Um, the, the, the problem with anxiety is when it begins to impact your functioning and you just, you fall apart. Um, that's when it becomes problematic, when it impacts your functioning and your, your relationships. Okay, let's see what other questions. Okay, um, so how do you cope with the possibility of losing your family members to this virus? I keep imagining the close reality of losing someone I love. All of a sudden, everyone I've ever known is facing the same threat at the same time. So yes, I mean, everyone is now thinking and imagining what would happen if somebody that I love passed away. And you know, the truth is we all know we're, we're gonna oh, at some point, right? So we, we all know this is going to happen. And so that's why I say this is a spiritual wake up call to us that we need to make the best of this time that we have in the present moment. We don't know what the future holds, right? But make the best of now. Focus, on, focus in on connecting with your family. And, you know, if there's any things that have happened, you know, and your family try to rectify those relationships, check in with each other, and just be kind during this time. Just be kind to one another and focus on what, what's happening here and now. Whenever you're think, worried about the future, just try to keep bringing yourself back, back to the present. Again, with deep breathing, with mindfulness practices, even reciting Quran is a wonderful mindfulness practice. When you recite it out loud, when you recite it with understanding, 
find ways to ground yourself back to the present moment because the narrative of what might happen is endless. We don't know what's gonna to happen to our family. So focus on what's in your control, bring yourself back. Okay, Let's see. Is it normal to not feel worried about all this? Okay, I mean, yeah, if you, everyone's reaction is gonna be different. So there are some people that maybe they've had a lot of different li difficult life experiences and, and trauma. Maybe, you know, you're pretty young, you know, you know your immune system is strong. You don't have any kind of chronic illnesses. You might be reacting to this a little bit differently than somebody who is elderly, somebody that um, has a compromised immune system. So um, yeah, I mean, if you don't feel worried about this, doesn't mean something's wrong with you. Everybody's reacting different to this. Okay, how can we create routines with kids while still keeping ourselves in a positive mindset? It's challenging to keep ourselves positive and productive, even more so to keep the family on track. Routines are critical for child development. Yeah, so having a routine is so important. And, you know, here's the thing. In the first couple of weeks, I think everybody's routines have been a little bit off because we're trying to figure things out. Really, who, which one of us was prepared for something like this happening in her lifetime? I, I mean, I certainly didn't see this coming. But, um, you know, it's okay the first couple of weeks not to have a good routine in place and, you know, just to work on that each day to try to improve it. But the main thing is we've, we've got to realize our kids can really sense our anxiety and stress. So if you're not taking care of your mental health with this, you're not taking moments for self-care to, you know, to pray, to exercise, to, to meditate, to eat well, um, and to, to get enough rest, to, you know, it, it's going to have an impact on them as well. So just try to be cognizant that your conversations at home aren't all about, you know, this virus so that they don't become alarmed and do your best, do your best to keep a routine that works for you and your family. And I think every family's routine might look a little bit different. It doesn't mean yours is, is wrong. You, have, you know what's best for your family to keep them on track. So try to create as much normalcy as you can with this situation. Um, even if it's, you know, they know they probably can't go to the playground but, or, or school, but take them out at least in the backyard to run around to at least get some fresh air, create some routine that works for you. Okay, how do we calm our friends and families? It turns into a vicious cycle of spreading fear. I try to change the, the topic on a positive note, but it's still difficult to, to shift the mindset so yeah, um, here's the thing. We don't have control really over how our friends or family members are responding to this. We can only control how we respond to the situation. And that's, that's what's so challenging is a lot of us um, are struggling with friends or family, um, the media who is just in a state of chaos, they're panicking. And because of this, it's, it's kind of, con it's very contagious when you're around that kind of energy. So you have to work extra hard to counter that from within. And I know for myself, I've had to tell family members, friends, like, listen, I love you. Thank you for sending me all these videos and things, but I, I just can't talk about the coronavirus one more time today. It's okay to, to set boundaries in a, in a tactful, respectful way with others that, you know, you, you just are trying to be present focused and do the best you can, and you don't want to get caught up in, in worrying about this anymore. Um, just let them know when you've reached your emotional limits. And usually people would be receptive to that, you know, if you, if you just are, are direct about it. Okay. Okay, so you said somebody, so as I'm saying, somebody wants to ask their question verbally. Do you have your audio on to hear their question directly? Let me let me go ahead and put my audio. Okay. If a, if um, the person wants to ask that question, they can go ahead and do that now. Okay. 
let me know if somebody's talking and I'm not hearing them. They might be, I'm not sure if everybody's muted already though. I'm gonna keep going until I hear the question. Okay, someone's saying why, um, okay, how does one hold on to the sense of empathy while at the same time being numb to the death toll, looking at them as human beings anymore, but just sheer statistics. I'm worried about apathy. So it, yeah, it's a delicate balance that you have to have where you want to protect your mental well-being, but at the same time, you, you can't get caught up in every statistic that you're hearing. So I think that, you know, the main thing to do is just to turn again, transform that worry um, about lack of apathy into prayer, that you're praying not just for your family, not just for your community, you're pl praying for the whole world to heal from this. And I believe, I hope every one of us today, inshallah, just focuses on that global prayer, because I believe when we have a global issue, the whole community needs to come together and pray all together um, to really, you know, affect change. So it's okay. It's okay to have moments where you feel like I need to step away from this. I can't get caught up in the numbers anymore um, because if you know, it's going to drain you emotionally and mentally to take every statistic, um, you know, with a lot of of mental anguish. So it's okay. It, it's not apathy. It's protecting your mental health in this situation. You have to choose your information and what you cho choose to internalize carefully and thoughtfully so that you don't get sucked into everything. It's okay not to be a part of every conversation around coronavirus too. I think some of us feel like we have to be at every conversation at the table about this, and that's just not good for your mental health. So sometimes looking at those numbers is just, it, it makes it worse um, to deal with. Okay. Okay, so um, someone's asking, what if one partner in a marriage is a pessimist and one partner is an optimist or used to be? How do you get back on track? How to get back to being optimistic and try to get the partner to see things in a more positive way? So the thing that you want to do is make sure that you're modeling for your partner a change. Okay, because I work with a lot of couples and sometimes I'm working just with the wife, you know, and or just with the husband and they want to create a shift. And what I always talk about is the importance of you being the one to change so that other people around you will be impacted by that change. When, when you model your self optimism and positive thinking, it's contagious just as much as that negative thinking and complaining behavior is contagious. So I would say focus on yourself rather than you trying to change your partner. You focus on your personal development and trying to impact yourself so that, you know, that your husband's going to notice a change right away. Like, oh, you know, I noticed you've been more positive lately. Um, and they'll, they'll, want, they'll feel good about that. It, it, it impacts the whole energy of the house. So inshallah, just through that modeling, it will also create a shift in their behavior naturally. So just don't worry about changing other people's behavior. Just focus on yourself first. Okay. All right. So I think that our time is up. And I, again, thank you so much for joining, for your wonderful questions. Again, if I can be of service to anyone, um, I'm going to type my website in the chat box right now. Feel free to reach out to me during this hard time. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you again. Allah bless you all. And I pray Allah keeps you all safe and healthy and, and strong during this pandemic. Thank you, Sister Anissa, and inshallah we'll be having more of these webinars coming out shortly. Thank you, everybody.